name is Dan Bidwell, Senior Minister here. It is super to have you at church. Uh, coming into Easter, um, we are starting a new little series for the next few weeks uh, that is Easter themed, you might have guessed from the Easter eggs on screen. And uh, as I thought about what I wanted to preach on, um, the, the idea of Easter eggs came to me, not the chocolatey kind, um, but the term uh, Easter eggs is actually a movie term um, where uh, the director puts a little surprise into the movie. Um, it's usually subtle, and, and it's something that usually only super fans will find. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, Indiana Jones, he's in the Well of Souls. He's trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, and uh, all over the walls are Egyptian, uh, Egyptian, what are they called? Hieroglyphs, or, or so you would think. Uh, but turns out in the top left-hand side, does anybody know this one? Top left-hand side in that circle... You have C-3PO and R2-D2, um, and, uh, and uh, apparently they use the same graphic on the back wall, scratched into the, um, into the hieroglyphs on the walls, um, and uh, somebody actually said, maybe the lady on the left, she looks like an Egyptian, might be Princess Leia, um, and each of the Indiana Jones movies contains an Easter egg, a Star Wars Easter egg, a hidden message for the viewer to discover. And uh, while I think our Easter stories in the Bible, I think they contain Easter eggs for us too. Um, un understated surprises that uh, make us sit up and pay attention. They, they make us uh, look deeper once we see them. So why don't we pray that we'll see uh, what surprises God has in store for us in the Bible today. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, you love justice and yet you also love mercy. Draw us into your bigger story of justice and mercy as you tell it through the story of Jesus. And give us ears to hear and hearts that beat for you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, uh, before we jump into our Bible passage, quick movie quiz. Uh, which movie is this? Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men. You can't. You can't handle the truth. Uh, what about this? Oh, there we go. What about this one? Aaron Brockovich, Rod Wallace, he's very fast off the mark. Uh, yeah, Aaron Brockovich. She brought a small town to its feet, a huge company to its knees. Um, what about this one? This is old school, very old school. Some of those 80s fans. Yeah, a couple. Break them around. Break them around. Brian Brown, Edward Woodward, and some other guy. Um, a ball war. I think, I think that's right. Anyway, uh, Break them around. And last one. Oh, Jack Thompson, to kill a mockingbird. Well done. Um, Gregory Peck. Uh, there was another film um, that I had in there, but we didn't have time, so I'm just going to waste my time and tell you about it anyway. Uh, do you remember um, all of the John Grisham movies, uh, all the John Grisham books, or lots of them got made into movies? There was one with Matthew McConaughey. I think it was called A Time to Kill, and he's a southerner, but um, they style him exactly like Gregory Peck with the light suits and the wavy hair. Um, there you go, probably an Easter egg in there. Uh, well, why do we love courtroom dramas? Well, I think we love them because they're never just an open and shut case. There's always a twist and a turn. Uh, there's always a key piece of evidence that remains undiscovered and uh, the tension rises and we're sort of kept wondering, will the innocent go free? Uh, will justice be served? And uh, how's it going to happen? Will they catch the bad guys? And as we open John chapter 18 this morning, we are faced with a courtroom drama. It unfolds before us. Uh, in the early light of dawn, this faceless mob, they drag a solitary man before the Roman governor and they bay for blood. Will justice prevail? Will the innocent go free? Will the truth be discovered in time? I wanted to jump right into the Easter story on the morning of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, it'll let us go there uh, later in the week as well. But um, just for context, the night before, Jesus had shared his final meal with his disciples in the upper room, and then he'd taken them out into the night. They'd gone into a garden uh, to pray. And then one of the disciples, Judas, um, who had been Jesus' good friend, uh, he betrayed Jesus, handed him over to the Jewish temple guards. And Jesus is arrested and he's taken before the Jewish high priest and the, the Jewish court in the middle of the night. He's beaten, uh, he's bound. And our story today picks up early the next morning. Uh, verse 28, with the Jews leading 
Jesus from Caiaphas, that is from the um, Jewish, from the Jewish high priest to the palace of the Roman governor. And so the trial has kind of escalated, um, like a trial moves from high court to supreme court. Uh, Jesus has faced the Jewish religious court, and now he's brought before the supreme authority in the land, which is the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And unlike the Jewish authorities, uh, the Roman governor, uh, Pontius Pilate, he held the power over life and death. Uh, he alone could authorize the execution of a Jewish criminal, uh, and this is actually what the Jewish leaders came to do. Um, they wanted to see Jesus killed. Uh, and you can see that from chapters early. And there's a little side note in here. Um, in the second paragraph there, verse 28b, see, by now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremony, ceremonial uncleanness, they didn't enter the palace because they wanted to, be, uh, to eat the Passover. Um, there's a, a sort of an irony here. They're ready to bring somebody to be executed. Um, in fact, they're going to conceal the truth and yet they don't want to make themselves dirty by going inside uh, a temple and eating with uh, a non-Jew. Well, there you go. So it's the day before Passover, perhaps the most important Jewish festival in the calendar. Um, Passover remembers God's people uh, and their rescue from slavery in Egypt. Uh, the Israelites had painted blood on their doors so that God's angel of uh, judgment would pass over their homes and leave them unharmed. And that Passover, I think, to Jewish people is a little bit like um, uh, Anzac Day and Gallipoli is to us here in Australia. It's that story that kind of makes us who we are. Well, for them, this was a story of being rescued by, God's peop uh, by God. Um, and so it's the day before Passover, this most important festival. Uh, to take part in the Passover, they had, to, uh, they had to avoid ceremonial uncleanness. They had to avoid coming into anything that would contaminate them spiritually. Uh, and so entering the house of a non-Jew would do that. And as we said, what an irony. They're, they're happy to do, uh, happy to uh, bring an innocent man for murder, but didn't want to get unclean in a different way. So now the Jews, they remain outside the palace, and Pilate comes out to them. I don't know if you find that odd. There's just so many details in this story. Here's this Roman governor. He's invested with all the authority of the Roman emperor. And yet he's forced to come out of his office, come out of his palace to deal with angry locals. And there's a power struggle going on here, isn't there? And you wonder who's in control. Where does the power lie? Is it with Pilate or is it with the people who are outside his palace? So Pilate, he comes out to them and he asks, what charges are you bringing against this man? Uh, there has to be a, a charge in every criminal trial, doesn't there? And uh, so what is the charge brought before Jesus in John chapter 18. Well, we don't have time to read it now, but if you read all the way through John chapter 18, the first 27 verses, there's no charge brought against Jesus. Um, do you find that strange? Jesus is arrested, verse 12, he's brought before the high priest, verse 19. Uh, the high priest questions Jesus about his disciples, questions him about his teaching, but no charge is ever laid against him at least not for the first 27 verses. And as a reader, it makes us wonder, what has Jesus done wrong? What charges could be brought against him? And here's what the Jews tell Pilate. They say, well, if you weren't a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. It's not much of a, not, not much of a case for the prosecution, is it? Well, he's a criminal, obviously. That's why we brought him. There's no charge in that. And it makes you wonder, is there something more going on? Of course, we know there's more going on. It seems to me like the Jews were trying to authorize a murder. They wanted to have the execution of an innocent man signed off on by somebody else. Um, if they thought Jesus was guilty of blasphemy, which they will say in a little while, why did they bring genuine charges against him that would result in a lawful execution? Instead, it seems like they're hiding the truth behind word games. And I think that's actually something that's going on in John's description of this trial. I think there's a concealed and hidden theme going on. We're waiting to hear the real reason why Jesus has been brought to Pilate. But the truth, the truth is elusive. The truth is hidden. Um, the truth is concealed. And, and I think John emphasized this concealed or hidden motif by referring um, to the Jews very generally. You know, normally we hear it's the, it's the chief priests or the Sanhedrin or it's the teachers or it's the scribes. Here they're just called the Jewish leaders. 
Well, compare this to Jesus in 18 verse 20. It says, he spoke openly to the world. It said, he said nothing in secret. Uh, In verse 23, Jesus spoke the truth. But the Jews seem to be deliberately hiding their real motives in bringing Jesus before Pilate. And so Pilate, I think, calls their bluff. Verse 31, Pilate says, well, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Well, finally, the truth comes out but we have no right to execute anyone they objected it's super clear what they want see it had long been the plan of the jewish leaders to have jesus killed simply put they wanted jesus dead because he was a threat to jewish political stability Uh, so if jesus were to become this jewish king then the roman empire the rome uh, rome whoever it was rome would come and wipe out the Jewish people. He'd wipe out every memory of them. Uh, we read this back in chapter 11. Uh, back in chapter 11, so seven chapters earlier, the chief priests and the Pharisees called together a meeting of the Sanhedrin, their high council, and, and they said, here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation." And then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, he said, you know nothing at all. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Um, What a loaded statement, isn't it? Um, the, the, The fact that actually that would be what happens. But looking at it from the Jewish leader's perspective, sacrificing Jesus for the sake of national stability, well, that was worth the cost. He says it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. Uh, From God's perspective, the death of Jesus was also a price worth paying, but with a very different outcome in mind. His death would be for the sins of many. One man would die so that many would be saved. And so Caiaphas' words, they're not just the words of a a self-interested man. Turns out God uses them as prophecy. So back in chapter 11, John says, Caiaphas didn't say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. You see, brothers and sisters, it it was always God's plan that Jesus would willingly leave his father's side and enter this dark world to bring it light. That's John chapter one, wasn't it? Jesus is the light. And I'm going to say more about uh, that, uh, the reason why Jesus came, why the cross is so important. I'm going to say a lot more about that this weekend, about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And we're going to save that for Good Friday. But come back to chapter 18, verse 32, because the truth about these fluffy charges and this sham of a trial, they're revealed. What looks like the scheme of man is actually shown to be the plan of God. So back in chapter 18, this happens. So the words of Jesus are the words that Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Um, I I talked about a power struggle a little bit before um, between uh, the Jewish leaders and and the Roman uh, leader, Pilate. Uh, But I think what we see here is it's Jesus who has all the power in this situation, doesn't he? He's the one who's in control. None of this is a power struggle. Um, Jesus willingly participates in this drama knowing that his death will bring life to many. And so he exercises his power by not exercising his power in a way. He he allows himself to be uh, killed in this way, to go through the trial in this way. So the truth is revealed finally. So it feels to me like the, the Jews are trying to conceal the truth. Well, Pilate, he gets to the heart of the truth when he goes inside the palace to question Jesus. Uh, Jesus uh, sorry, pa- Pilate went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Just like the Jewish leadership, um, Pilate was concerned that Jesus was seeking political kingship. Uh, if he did, if Jesus was seeking political kingship, it would be a threat to uh, his own leadership, it would be a threat to the Roman emperor. And um, Pilate uh, was already on dangerous ground with the emperor. Uh, his relationship with the Jews had been tested uh, earlier on in 26 AD, right after his appointment, he tried to introduce Roman emblems into the streets of Jerusalem and uh, the people, uh, the Jewish people rebelled and they forced Pilate to back down on it. 
and it never looks good when you're the new guy and you can't control the locals. And, uh, and now it's the day before the biggest Jewish festival of the year and Pilate's in this tricky position. How do you please these power brokers standing in front of you and how do you please your boss? And so he says to Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? It's a question, isn't it? What is it you've done? Well, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were so, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. Well, Pilate seizes on this. He says, so you are a king then. You are a king. You have to imagine what's going through Pilate's mind at this point. How can Jesus have a kingdom that is not of this world? What does that mean? How can his kingdom be from another place? Well, Jesus goes one step further. He says, you're right in saying that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. And for this, I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So before we had the truth concealed, and now we have this truth revealed that Jesus is, is the king he was born to testify to the truth that he is the king and there are those who will listen to jesus and they'll believe and then there'll be those who won't listen to jesus they won't believe they'll be the ones who listen and they're on the side of truth and then those who refuse to listen they belong to who well the bible calls him the father of lies truth revealed truth concealed truth accepted and truth rejected truth is important isn't it well, Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? Isn't that the question? I think that's our Easter egg for today. That question, what is truth? It's a question so many of our friends ask. What, what is the truth and who cares anyway? Well, I think as followers of Jesus, we care about the truth. If there is only one truth, in this world that's what we care about um and i was thinking I, I might do a jack nicholson thing you know do you want the truth and you say yes i want the truth and i say you can't handle the truth and nobody laughs or you laugh at how pathetic it was maybe that's the way we should share the gospel this easter do you want the truth come on hello the internet who's watching later on as a church who listens to Jesus, uh, we want to be a church where the truth of the gospel, uh, where we have the truth, sorry, where the truth of the gospel inspires us to testify courageously that Jesus is the King. We want to testify to exactly what Jesus said. He is the King. That is the truth. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's the only way to come to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father except through the Son. But you know what? Pilate couldn't handle that truth. Pilate couldn't handle that truth. It was too hard. With his angry mob at his door, Pilate does what he has to do in order to keep peace. And so he goes out to the Jews again. He says, I find no basis for a charge against him. And it's your custom for me to release one prisoner to you at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they say, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Give us the insurrectionist. Give us the rebel. Give us this guy who'd been participating in a rebellion against you. So the truth takes a back seat as Pilate gives the people what they wanted. This known insurrectionist is freed and the one against whom no basis for a charge could be found, well, they hold on to him. And justice seems so hidden from view at this point of the story, doesn't it? And the justice, I think, only deepens in chapter 19 Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and they went up to him again and again say, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. And the original language, that verb for slapped, it, it indicates like again and again they kept doing it. So Pilate literally adds insult to injury. As the soldiers humiliate Jesus as they mock him and beat him. And it barely seems possible for one human to do this to another until you look at how many times in history it's happened. Why are we like this? Why do we allow these things to happen? It's horrific. 
But this scene isn't even the end of the trial. Pilate goes back and forth again and again between the Jews and Jesus. He goes from outside to inside and back again. He becomes increasingly agitated. The crowd becomes increasingly agitated. The scenes switch rapidly between light and dark and chaos and calm and wrong and right. Once more, Pilate comes out. He says to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, which are the signs of a king, by the way, Pilate said to them, here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. Well, Pilate answers them, well, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against this man. And the Jews insisted, well, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Three times Pilate states he can find no basis for a charge against Jesus. And now verse 6, the chief priests and the officials lead the crowd in shouting, crucify. You know that crucifixion was horrific. We're not going to talk about that. It's this Roman punishment designed to induce an agonizing uh, pain and death that would take days, hours or days, Again, can't imagine that kind of thing happening in open public. Um, But there's a second meaning behind crucifixion as well. Uh, For Jewish people, uh, what God had said in the Old Testament is that if anybody's hung on a tree or hung on a pole because they're worthy of death, they're actually under God's curse. And they had to be careful to bring them down off the pole before nightfall, otherwise God's curse would fall on the land. And so here we have these leaders asking for Jesus to be crucified, to be put under the curse of God. He has to to take a very special kind of vindictiveness to want somebody to fall under the curse of God. But as we often see in the Bible, what people meant for evil, God used for good. And so even in the midst of human injustice on Good Friday, we're going to see on the cross on Friday that justice is revealed fully and finally. Real justice and lasting justice. Um, Justice that brings peace between sinful humanity and the holy God. Are we going to talk about that on Friday when we think about that little word, it is finished, that Jesus said on the cross. Justice will be revealed. Uh, So as we finish, what do we learn as we watch this courtroom drama unfold before us? Well, I think the biggest lesson we need to take away is that this is not not just a a story, it's not just a courtroom drama, it's not a story based on real events, this is the real event, uh, written by the author of life to show us the way to find true life. You see, this trial is how God the Father and God the Son chose from time immemorial to save people from their sins. This horrific earthly trial, it's actually the painful means to a beautiful end, which is the rescue of God. And more than that, even though we see this earthly courtroom drama played out in the pages of the Bible, I think it reminds us to to, to look heavenly, to cast our eyes heavenwards. Because even though we see this earthly courtroom drama playing out in the scripture that we've just read, at the same time, an even greater courtroom drama was playing out in heaven, in the heavenly courtroom. And there in heaven, there was no truth concealed. There was no injustice that was hidden. All of the sins of humanity were revealed and opened as written in the book and seen under the gaze of God. There were no secrets that remained hidden on that day. And the basis for charges were found against each and every one of us for what we've done and the way that we treated God. And there in heaven, as justice waits, as justice against us waits, one person stepped in and said, Take me instead. In Galatians, it says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. Jesus died so that we don't have to stand under the curse of God, under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God. He died so that we can be free. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of true justice in the face of all of the evils that humans do and particularly our own evil we thank you that we won't stand under your judgment if we trust in Jesus Christ but instead 
he will stand in our place and receive our judgment, that his death will be so that we can be set free. Thank you, Father, for this great mercy and grace. Pray that we trust you and follow you every day for the precious sake of Christ. Amen.